Joining us again for the interview is Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma. Senator, thank you very much for staying with us. I'm glad you could. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, one of the things that's sort of um, buoyant and happy in your book is that you pretty gleefully talk about criticism uh, you have received as a senator. I was very flattered that in a couple of different times in the book, you talked about me uh, mentioning you on this show. Um, you specifically called me out for a show that I did and where I talked about you on December 3rd, 2009. Did you actually watch that show that you mentioned in the book? Okay, uh, you have to repeat it. What happened on December 3rd? December 3rd, 2009, I mentioned you on my show, and you twice in the book write about how I talked about you on my show. I'm wondering if you actually saw the show or if somebody just gave you a well, I'm sure. No, I'm sure I did, but okay. you know, th this book is 320 pages of fine print, and I can't remember exactly what happened on that day. I, I just, if you tell a, me, I'll tell you whether or not, it, you know. All right, it's just the, it's the part about me, so I just wanted to, I mean, you made it seem in your book uh, like I went after you just because you had just gone to the Copenhagen summit. Um, oh, but that, I see. That, that wasn't what I was talking about, actually, uh, in, in, in most part on the show that night. Here's what we did on the show that day and when, when we talked about you. I just want you to see it now. The family, of course, the secretive religious organization that runs the C Street Dormitory for lawmakers in Washington. It's led by a man named Doug Coe. Republican Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma credits Doug Coe with launching his own activism in Africa. Doug has always been kind of behind the scenes and very quiet. He taught me into going to Africa. I had no interest in going to Africa. Religious conservatives saw Uganda specifically as a place that they could have some real influence. Uganda's first lady became an emphatically born-again Christian. Her husband, the president, is believed to have serious ties to the family. Same goes for the ethics minister of Uganda, as well as a number of legislators there. Senator Sam Brownback traveled there to look into the AIDS issue in 2005. Senator James Inhofe made at least 20 trips to Africa just since 1999, mostly to Uganda, as well as Ethiopia. In March of this year, a group of three American evangelicals traveled to Uganda for a conference on the evils of homosexuality. Their message was that homosexuality is a choice, that it can be cured by a relationship with Jesus. There's been a dual effort underway here, anti-gay proselytizing by American evangelicals and assurances from conservative American politicians that we can solve that nation's AIDS problem. The culmination of these efforts, this massive focus on Uganda, is a piece of legislation that's been introduced in that country now that attempts, it says, to tackle the AIDS problem in that country and the problem of homosexuality all at once. It's a bill that calls for the execution of any gay Ugandan who is HIV positive who was caught having gay sex. It's death by hanging, specifically. And it's not just gay Ugandans who are HIV positive who are being targeted. The sentence just for being gay is life imprisonment. This bill was written by a Ugandan legislator reportedly taken in by Republican Senator James Inhofe and the family here in America. We've made repeated calls to the offices of Senator James Inhofe and Senator Sam Brownback. We have yet to hear back from either of them on this issue, despite the fact that they've been so proudly outspoken on issues affecting Uganda. Senator, when you talked about that show in your book, you made it sound like I was going after you for Copenhagen, but that was the actual context. And that Kill the Gays bill is back now. Um, I'm wait, wondering if you want to weigh in on that on that issue for the first time publicly and say if you're for it or against it. Are you saying, are you suggesting, Rachel, I, I want to make sure that everyone understands this, that I am for executing gays, that I somehow knew something about what their philosophy is over there and what they're doing legislatively. I know Uganda. I know Ethiopia. I know Ghana. I know Benin. I, I know Africa probably better than uh, anyone else, certainly in the United States Senate. I've spent a lot of time over there. I've developed close relations over there. And when 9-11 happened, I was, since I was the only member of the Armed Services Committee who knew where Africa was, and we had making a decision then to get into Africa to help train them to resist all these things that are coming into the state, uh, into the country, into the continent, that's, that's what I did. So I do know Africa well. As far as Doug Coe is concerned, you know, I think I, when you hear about persecution for the sake of righteousness, it, I can't think of a better example. I wish you knew Doug Coe. I've never known anyone in my life that just loves everyone, uh, you know, I, and I see him persecuted and I, my heart bleeds for him. And I, I do, you know, I, I am sorry that you did that. That's that's way out of. Well, uh, well Senator, I did that scope. in 2009, and that's what you were quoting me from, totally yeah. out of context. Okay. I mean, the reason I'm asking well, then is I, the, then the I, kill then the I go with what I said because I think it's really bad. Well, when you, let when me you go after a guy like that just because you. he believes 
I'm sorry. So the, the, the Kill the Gays bill sponsor is, has brought the bill back now, and he's telling reporters as of last month that the whole idea for the Kill the Gays bill came from, as the New York Times put it, quote, a conversation with members of the fellowship a.k.a. the no, family, in 2008. Wrong. This is what he says. This is how he explains where the bill Who came from. Who is he? He is David is... Bahati. He says it was. he was told by Americans that it was too late in America to propose such legislation. That's David and, Bahati and, speaking and, to the New York and Times. And can you tell me who he is? I've never heard him. Who David is he? Bahati was described as the family and the fellowship's key man in Uganda. Did you ever talk to any Ugandan how, legislators? How would I know if, if, how could he, I don't have any idea who you're talking about. And I certainly don't have any idea on this accusations of, executing gays. Uh, you know, let's talk about the book or let's talk about something to do with uh, global warming instead of getting off on these hysterical things. Well, certainly, sir, this isn't hysterical. This is the context in which you brought me up in your book totally out of context. And so I'm trying to redress something that's wrong in your book. I didn't. I, I wasn't see. talking about Copenhagen when I brought you Ooh. up. I was talking about Uganda and your contacts with Ugandan legislators and influential people in Uganda who claim that their relationship with American conservatives, such as yourself, associated with the fellowship, are how they came up with the Kill the Gays bill. That's why I'm asking you. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. And uh, 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 the individuals you're talking about, I don't know. that. I do know Doug Coe. And I think, uh, I can't think of a greater injustice being done to any great person than what's been done to him. Well, I'd be happy to talk to him if he'd ever return my calls. I've, we've tried to contact him numbers of times oh, he, on this issue, and he won't talk. Okay, that sounds good. Well, let me just ask you one last question so we can agree on some, end on something we agree with, which is about global warming. By the warming. way, did you like the chapter on the igloo my daughter wrote? It was, uh, it was, it was a funny, it was a funny um, anecdote. The fact that your family calls you Popeye for Pop Inhofe is very cute. Yeah, Popeye. Yeah, I always remember. I remember when my uh, one of my granddaughters came over to school, and this is a true story. She, I think this might be in the book. She said, "Popeye, she's in the fifth grade. Why is it you don't understand global warming?" And I said, "Well, why'd you ask that?" I went back and I checked. She was in a public school. That everything came from the Environmental Protection Agency, brainwashing my grandkids in school. And this is one of the things that uh, is my goal to try to stop, and that is unelected bureaucrats. Uh, taking positions contrary to the elected officials and brainwashing our kids. That'd be a good subject for you and me to talk about sometime. Well, here, here's something on which I think we might be able to agree on, whether or not we agree on brainwashing. Um, it is the issue of, of, of free market capitalism and energy. E even if we don't agree on global warming, shouldn't you and I agree that taxpayers shouldn't be giving $4 billion a year uh, in subsidies to the oil industry because the oil industry is so profitable. And even if they're not profitable, shouldn't the free market be taking care of that? Why are we subsidizing well, oil? First of all, I don't call that a subsidy. Those are taxes. When they talk about the manufacturing tax that they're talking about repealing that Obama has been trying to do in his effort to do away with fossil fuels, that's a tax that all manufacturers pay. And that's one that, uh, that would, is, is for them. Now, you talk about subsidies. What about the subsidies for wind, for solar, all of those subsidies? And I have to say, a lot of those came during the Bush administration. So uh, uh, that, that'd be a good topic to talk but about. But the $4 billion hey. in taxes that they would pay if they weren't singled out to be subs get a tax subsidy for their manufacturing, don't you think that the oil industry can handle that on their own? They don't need, they don't need that kind of help, do they? No, they're, uh, they're actually doing very well right now, yeah. and I'm glad we're finding you this. We could, there are a key to being self-sufficient, and I think it can happen. By the way, we do agree on one other thing. Rachel, and that is, and I say the same thing about my friend Barbara Boxer. I really love people who are liberal and don't uh, and, and, and and are honest about it. The ones I don't like are the hypocrites. I had a good friend that was a, uh, a, a very liberal person I served with in, the, in Congress, who's deceased now. And I said, "How in the world do you get by with all those liberal positions?" And 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 you're you're from the state of Oklahoma. And he said, "It's very it's easy, and Hoff, all you do is vote liberal and press release conservative. We have a lot of. Can you name one person who votes conservative and press releases liberal?" Well, a lot of liberals think that about most Democrats, that Democrats try to seem more liberal than they are, and they go along with you guys too much. So I think it's, I think this is, this, we live at opposite ends of a telescope, Senator. And you uh, when you look into the middle, we can't see much of each other, but I appreciate us at least trying, and I'm gra grateful that you, you were bet. here tonight. Thank you. Th thank you. Senator Richard. James Inhofe of Oklahoma. All right. He's all, his new book is called The Greatest Hoax, How the Global Warming Conspiracy Threatens Your Future. We'll be right back. Correction! 
Um, I'm not going to fact check every argument that he and I had uh, right now, but I got to say, when Senator Inhofe called a Clinton era tax hike the biggest tax increase in three decades just a moment ago, uh, he was not right about that. Um, in the senator's book, he makes the same mistake, uh, except he calls it there the biggest tax increase in history. It wasn't. Uh, the biggest peacetime tax hike ever, actually, was not the Clinton tax hike that Senator Inhofe is describing in 1993. It was the Ronald Reagan tax hike in 1982. Uh, Clinton's tax hike was $30 billion. Reagan's tax hike was $37.5 billion. Because it was Ronald Reagan who levied the biggest peacetime tax increase in American history, I think it is sometimes hard for conservatives to remember that, but that is, in fact, the truth. And I am grateful Senator Inhofe was here tonight. I hope he'll come back. I uh, said at the end of the interview he enjoyed it and he thought it was fair, which was a nice thing. Uh, talking with people with whom you disagree is healthy, and I find it fun. Bob McDonald, please call me.